Chapter 4 Among the Peaks Some yards up, I came to a ledge upon which I sat and took another look at Fort Defiance. I saw a light figure cross the drawbridge, and then up went the bridge itself. I resumed my journey, half walking, half climbing, and a half hour later, when I looked back again, I was much astonished to see lights blazing at every window of Fort Defiance. I watched for some minutes, but I was too far away to see figures moving or anything else that would tell me the cause of the lights. Convinced that it was no time for idle curiosity about illuminations, I turned my face toward the southwest, determined to carry out my instructions. Yet I saw readily that my problem was not yet wholly solved. I had escaped from the fort, but I had not escaped from the mountains, which at that hour looked very dark, very bleak, and very lonely. I picked out a large clear star burning in the southwest just above the tip of the highest peak and made it my guide. It was rough traveling, but the night was cold and my limbs had been stiffening in confinement. The sharp air and the exercise were a tonic to me. The blood ran freely through my veins and I felt strong and buoyant. I resolved to walk all night a resolution born partly of necessity, for I could not lie down and sleep without finding every joint stiffened in the morning by cold. With my eyes fixed on my star, I tramped steadily to the southwest. It was not an especially dark night, but I kept as closely as I could to the valleys or rifts, and the uplift of the peaks above me hid half the skies. I am not superstitious, and I think I possess at least average courage, but the silence and solemnity of the mountains awed me and made me lonely and afraid. I seemed to be alone in the universe, save for the misty peaks, which nodded to each other and never noticed me. It may be flattering to one's vanity to feel that he is the only man in the world, but it soon grows tiresome. I longed for company, a chum, somebody to talk to me. I may be skillful in analyzing the feelings of others, but I had little success with my own. As the chill loneliness thickened around me, I wished again for Fort Defiance. Out of danger now, the danger that I had been in seemed so little, incredible perhaps. After all, I might have yielded too easily to a frightened girl's fears. But she had been frightened on my account. That was a tender thought. I smiled in the darkness at the thought and the memory of that early kiss, for which I was not sorry. The cold darkness of the mountains and the warm walls of Fort Defiance began to contend for first place in my mind. The belief that in the flush of the interview with his daughter I had overrated the fanaticism of the colonel grew, and my sense of loneliness egged it on until it became conviction. The strength and courage which I had felt at the start waned. The cold slid into my bones and chilled the marrow. I sat for a few moments on a big stone at the bottom of a great cleft that I might rest myself. Over the knife edge of the tallest ridge, a moon very white and cold looked at me as if wondering what I was doing in an otherwise deserted world. To this I could return no answer. All my intentions were failing. I was uncertain of myself. The advice to me to push on continually to the southwest had been clear and decisive and I had been following it most diligently for at least three hours. But there was my star in the southwest burning as brilliantly as ever, and also as far away as ever. Above me were the dusky skies, the moon calm and cold, and about me was the wilderness. I shut my eyes and saw my room in Fort Defiance, a cell still, but sheltered and warm. 
The wind began to blow. It had a sharp edge of ice, and I shivered. Then I sprang up in fright as a great groan came down the cleft, past me, and went on among the mountains through valley and valley, between cliff and cliff, and from peak to peak. I knew after my first start what it was, but it frightened me as if it had been a ghost, though I am a full-grown man, and, as I said before, I think I have at least average courage. It was the wind, gathered and compressed in the narrow deep ravines between the tall cliffs, and driven on by other winds behind, until it cried out like a man in deadly pain. Not until then, when the mountains were awake and groaning, did I comprehend how deep and intense may become the sense of desolation. I had noticed the wonderful repetition of the echoes when I fired my rifle to attract the attention of the colonel, but at night these echoes were deepened and carried faster from peak to peak and ridge to ridge. As the wind gained in strength and swept through the trees and bushes on the slopes and crests, as well as through the ravines and valleys, new tones were added, and I listened to the chorus of the mountains. The groan changed to a deep bass. With it were mingled the flutter and rustle of the dry leaves as the wind blew them together, leaf on leaf and the higher note of a wandering breeze as it escaped from a ravine and swept triumphantly over ridge and peak. I was content to listen a while to the music of the mountains, but I found that my joints were growing stiff with cold. One needs more than music, however sublime, on a dark night in November, unsheltered save by the skies. I took out some food, ate it, and resumed my journey, without much courage, however, I will confess. My star was still there, but like the moon, it was unsympathetic and cold, and it traveled due southwest as fast as I. I think I was a bit shaken by my situation and my inability to drive away the sense of desolation. It is easy enough to say that superstition and all such kindred things are folly, as perhaps they are, but put a man down where I was, let him go through what I had gone through, and he will have a ghost gibbering at him from every peak. So when I saw a light flaming on a crest where no light had been before, I was not at all sure whether I saw it with eyes real or imaginary. It was no star. The flame was too bright, too red, and flickered too much for that. Presently a light blazed up on another hilltop, and then on a third, and then on a fourth. They were moved about as if signaling to each other, and I was positive that I was growing lightheaded. It would require no common, normal pair of eyes to see so many lights dancing a jig. All the hilltops seemed to be afire, and I was quite sure that was not natural. The sound of a trumpet, loud, clear, and penetrating, mingled with the songs of the winds, and swept through the mountains, echo after echo. The military note rose above all the rest, and there by the first light, which formed the background for it and made it visible, I saw a human figure. I had no doubt that this was the man who blew the trumpet, and it meant that the colonel and his men were seeking to retake me. The trumpet was blown again, and all the lights except the first were extinguished. As I said, I am unable to analyze myself, and while a few moments ago I wished to be back at Fort Defiance, I wished nothing of the kind now that I knew the colonel and his men were seeking to take me there. I pushed myself among some bushes, determined that I would escape. With mountain heaped on mountain and the night helping, it would seem that it was an easy enough matter for me to escape, but I was not so sure. I had followed perforce some sort of path or trace, because it was the only way in which I could go, and doubtless these men knew the way well. 
The trumpets blew one more blast, and from my covert I saw the last light extinguished. Listening intently, I could hear only the sob of the wind down the great slash in the mountains, at the bottom of which I lay. I supposed that the flaming up of the lights and the blowing of the trumpets had been some sort of signal to draw the men together. I rose, but I could not see them either. I thought once of trying to climb the side of the mountain, but I feared a stumble or a slip, the noise of which would draw them to me. I pressed farther back into the bushes, but just as I made myself snug, several men turned the angle of the ravine, and one of them held up a bright lantern. Its flame fell directly upon me. "'Take aim!' shouted the colonel. The six who were with him covered me with their rifles, but I had no desire to be shot. "'It's all right, colonel,' I said. "'I'll surrender. I'm your prisoner.' He ordered the men to lower their weapons. I walked out of the bushes toward the colonel. There was some comfort in the company of my kind, even if I was to be the prisoner and they the free men, an inequality which I thought was not deserved." "'We retook you more easily than we thought,' said the colonel. "'Then double my debt of gratitude to you, colonel,' I said. "'You may have saved me again from death by starvation.' He said nothing to this, and I added, "'Suppose we rest a little. I am tired.' My bones in truth were weary. We were a long way from Fort Defiance, and the road was rough. I contemplated the journey with dismay. The colonel, who seemed to be highly pleased at my recapture, was in good temper. He took a long flask from his inside pocket and shook it. A cheerful gurgle came forth. He drew the cork with a loud plunk, and a pleasant odor permeated the air. "'Try that,' he said, holding out the flask. I tried it, and great was the result thereof. As the rich red liquor trickled down my throat, I could feel strength flowing back into muscle and bone, and a warm glow crept through all the veins of my chilled body. I handed the flask back to the colonel with my heartfelt thanks. "'I think I will try a little myself,' he said, and the pleasant gurgle was heard again. "'Colonel?' I said, you may shoot me tomorrow, but for heaven's sake, don't make me walk all the way back to Fort Defiance tonight. The liquor had put him in a still better humor. I will not, he said. Besides, I am tired myself. He gave a few directions to his men, and they began to gather brushwood, which was scattered about in abundance. They heaped it up in a sheltered corner of the ravine, and the colonel, taking the candle out of his lantern, touched the flame to the dry boughs. Up it blazed, and the wind catching it, the eager flame leaped from bough to bough. The wood snapped and crackled as the fire seized it, and the blaze, rising high, threw its warm and friendly light upon our faces. Though a captive, and with only twelve or so hours of life before me, according to the colonel's limitations, I achieved comfort. I made myself at home, and pulling up a billet, sat down on it before the fire, where body and eyes could feast on its warmth and light. The fire, by contrast, made the darkness beyond its radius darker. The colonel shivered, and then imitated my example, turning his palms to the flames. "'Makes me think of the winter of sixty-four, he said. "'Which was a long time ago,' I replied. "'But it may come again,' said he. "'Never,' said I. "'The cause is dead and buried, Colonel, and the mourners are few at this late day.' He turned his head away impatiently, as if he would not argue with a prisoner. His men kept silent, too. I had hoped they would hear, but I could not say. They, as well as I, had brought food with them. 
we broke bread and ate. The fire, which rose yards high and crackled as it ate into the wood, threw streaks of light on the near slopes. Beyond, the darkness had settled down over peak and ridge, and the moon was behind a veil of clouds. The wind, rising again, moaned loudly down the ravine and swept the dry leaves before it. I would not have escaped if I could. "'Winter will soon be here,' said Crothers, who sat on one side of me. "'Perhaps it's as well,' said Colonel Hetherell. "'It will make the harder for any enemy to reach Fort Defiance.' A blast of wind struck me on the back of the neck and slipped down my collar like a stream of ice water. I edged up within scorching distance of the fire. "'It is cold,' said the colonel, replying to my thought as if I had spoken aloud. He, too, edged up to the fire, and all his men did likewise. No one regarded me with hostile eyes. For the moment, the military laws of the Confederacy rested lightly. I don't understand how people can fight in the dark and when it's at zero. Our faces were warm, a little too warm, perhaps, but our backs were cold. I suggested to the colonel that we build another fire a few yards off and sit between the two. He looked at me approvingly, and even said nothing when I helped to gather brushwood for the second fire, just as if I were one of the party and could go and come where I wished. While I was busy thus, I noticed he was looking at me very intently and twisting his long white moustache as if he were in doubt. I guessed that he would have something to say to me soon, and I was not wrong. We lighted the second heap of wood, and the blaze sputtered and roared as if it would outdo its comrade ten yards away. We lolled in the heat for a few moments, and then the colonel, as I expected he would, beckoned to me. We went on the far side of the second fire, where none of the men would hear us. "'What is it, colonel?' I asked politely. "'Can I help you in any way?' "'You can,' he replied and in helping me you will help yourself at the same time. Then it ought to be easy for us to strike a bargain, I said. I want some information from you, said the colonel. Your escape was discovered soon after it was made, but that escape would not have been possible without assistance. Name the man to me, and I will spare your life. I will send you back to your own country. My first impulse was to speak violently. This was the first time he had touched the quick. But unrestrained anger is seldom worth the while. Colonel, I said, I may be a Yankee spy as you call me, but you can scarcely expect me to tell you that. Nor would I have told him, even had not the traitor been his own daughter. The colonel looked confused and hesitated. Presently, he said, I should not have made you the offer, and I apologize. Perhaps I have underestimated you. This was not very flattering, as it could be construed different ways, but I thanked him nevertheless, and we went back to our good position between the fires. The colonel was silent and looked thoughtful. I guessed that he was trying to divine the traitor and would not let the matter drop. I had eaten heartily, and the food, the heat, and the weariness together made a strong soporific. My head nodded and my eyelids drooped. The colonel, too, looked as if he would like to go to sleep. The men had blankets with them, and I made a proposition. Colonel, I said, give me a blanket and let me go to sleep. You needn't guard me. I pledge you my word I won't attempt to escape tonight. He took one look at the banked-up darkness. The wind made a long moan down the ravine. I don't think he will try, he said dryly. Crothers, give him a blanket. 
Crothers tossed me the blanket. I rolled myself in it and went to sleep. Far in the night I awoke. I might have gone back to sleep again in a moment or two, but a bough burned through fell into the ashes, sending up a shower of sparks. I held open my sleepy eyes and looked around at the colonel's little army, which, to the last man, lay stretched upon its back or side fast asleep. Two high privates were even snoring. The wind was still strong, and its groans as it swept through the ravine rose to a shriek. The fires had burned down a bit and were masses of red coals. Colonel Hetherell was lying next to me. The light from the fire fell directly upon his thin, worn old face. In my soul I felt pity for him. His exposed hands looked chilled, and his blanket seemed light for a man whose blood had been thinned by age. My own blanket was heavy and wide. I threw the corner of it over him, and in another minute I yielded again to sleep. I was the last to wake in the morning, and I do not know how much longer I would have slept had not the colonel pulled me violently by the shoulder. The sun was risen already above the mountains, and peak and ravine shone in the light. One of the men had produced some coffee and a small tin coffee pot, and was making the best of all morning drinks over the fire. Another was frying strips of bacon. Evidently, the Confederate army meant to treat itself well. I sniffed the pleasing aromas, bethinking me that as the only prisoner present, I was entitled to my share. The colonel did not neglect me. When my turn came, the tin cup filled with coffee was passed me, and I ate my due allotment of the bacon. The colonel, however, was stiff and restrained. His military coolness returned with the daylight, and his little army reflected his manners. My attempts at conversation were repelled, and soon it became apparent to me that I was the condemned spy again. The day was cold but very bright and well suited for our rough walking. The breakfast ended, we abandoned the fire which still glowed red in the ravine, and began our return to Fort Defiance, Crothers leading the army, while I walked in the center of it. Ours was a silent walk. If their feelings had changed with the day, so had mine. I regretted that I had not escaped. In the bright sunlight the mountains did not look so unfriendly and formidable, but I made up my mind to ask few questions and to abide the issue. Near noon I saw the same column of smoke which had once been such a cheering sight to me, and in a quarter of an hour more I looked down on Fort Defiance and its peaceful valley. The place had lost none of its beauty. The glow of red and brown and yellow in the foliage was as bright and as deep as ever. The little river was fluid silver in the sunshine. We paused a few moments at the last slope to rest a little. The quiet landscape, set like a vase in the mountains, seemed to appeal to Colonel Hetherell as it appealed to me. We were standing a little apart from the others. I said, It is too much like a country seat, Colonel, to be invaded by an enemy. I thought once it was secure from invasions, he said, looking at me suspiciously. But since there are traitors within my own walls, I must prepare for anything. He spoke as if he intended to make trouble about the matter, and since I had no fit reply, I said nothing. We descended into the valley, and when we crossed the drawbridge, we met Grace Hetherell standing at the door. She expressed no surprise, but looked at me reproachfully. I felt that she wronged me, for certainly I had tried to escape. I was sent to a new room, much like the other, but with a heavier door. The window, well crossbarred, looked out, like all the other windows, upon the mountains. When I had been locked up an hour, Miss Hetherell came. 
"'You see I am back, Miss Hetherell,' I said jauntily. "'Who comes oftener than I?' "'Why did you not escape when I gave you the chance?' she said, with the utmost reproach in her voice. I felt hurt at her manner. I knew she was thinking less of my death than of her father's responsibility for it. I hold myself to be of some value, and did not wish to be cheapened in any such manner. "'I did my best to escape, Miss Hetherell,' I said, "'but the activity of the Confederate Army was too great for me.' Her eyes flashed with such anger that I saw my mistake at once. "'I beg your pardon,' I said. "'I will not jest again at the Colonel's faith.' "'I have come to tell you,' she said, "'that you are in as much danger as you were yesterday. "'I do not think my father will alter his sentence.' "'But first, I said, "'he is going to find out the traitor who helped me to escape last night.' I supposed, of course, that she would tell him her part in it, having nothing to fear, and I was surprised when she answered me. "'He has been endeavoring to ascertain it already,' she said, but has failed. He thinks Dr. Ambrose is the man, and both the doctor and I are willing for the present to let him think so. "'You will under no circumstances tell him that it was I. Will you promise me that?' I will promise, since you ask, but it seems strange, Miss Hetherell. It is because I wish to be free to help you. If my father knew it was I, he would lock me up until you were, were, executed. Yes, that is it, though I did not like to say it. I could not say no to such a plan, for I valued my life and any one in my place would have been acute enough to see that Grace Hetherell would be the most powerful friend I could have inside of Fort Defiance. The doctor, too, must be weakening in his Confederate faith, if he were willing for my sake to rest under his commanding officer's suspicion. But that might be done for... love. Pshaw, sure, he was too old. I thanked her very earnestly for her endeavors to save me. "'I will seek to delay action on my father's part,' she said. "'Our chief hope rests in that.' I trusted that she would secure the delay, indefinite delay. When the door was opened for her to leave, I saw a sentinel on guard in the hall and became convinced that the colonel was taking very few chances with me. CHAPTER Five: A CHANGE OF SITUATIONS Crothers, as usual, brought me my meals, and in that respect I was well treated. The night passed without event, and the next morning I was allowed to take a walk around the fort between Crothers and another soldier, but I saw nothing of either the colonel or his daughter. I tried to pump Crothers, but he was proof against my most skillful questions, and when I returned to my room, I could boast no increase of knowledge. Yet I was not much depressed. I comforted myself with the old reflection that it was the year of peace, 1896, and I would not become really alarmed until I stood up before a file of the colonel's men and looked into the muzzles of their rifles. I received a visit the next morning from the colonel himself, his manner was still of a piece with that he had shown on the return march from the mountains, marked by a certain haughtiness and reserve differing much from the fiery temperament characteristic of him. "'Well, am I to be shot today, Colonel?' I asked, and I think I asked it cheerfully, for, mark you, I had returned to my old state of incredulity. "'Not today,' he said. I have decided to postpone it until I find where the treason in my garrison lies. You can see that your death might be in the way of my investigation. I could see it with ease, and I was glad that it was so. He asked me a lot of questions which he intended to be adroit, but I saw their drift clearly enough and led him further astray. 
When he was through, he knew less than ever about my rescuer, and I let him think it was one of his men. "'I shall discover the man by tomorrow,' he said, with a show of confidence which was but a show, "'and his fate shall be severe enough to put a stop to any leanings others may have the same way.' Three days more passed in this manner. I was permitted to take two walks daily around the fort in the company of Crothers and another man, but as before I could obtain no information from them, and I remained in ignorance of the colonel's progress, or lack of progress, with his secret service. On the fourth day my door was abruptly thrown open, and Grace Hetherell entered. Her face showed great excitement. The door was not closed behind her, but stood wide open, and I noticed that no sentry was in the hall. I was convinced that something of importance had happened. "'Mr. West,' she said, "'we need your help.' "'My help?' I exclaimed involuntarily. "'How can I, who need it so much myself, give anybody help?' "'But you can,' she cried. "'There is trouble in Fort Defiance.' "'Then her first flush of excitement over, "'she told me the story calmly. "'She was not long in the telling. "'Her hint to her father that Dr. Ambrose "'might have been the man who assisted in my escape "'had produced greater results than she expected. "'The old colonel had watched the doctor closely, and at last had accused him of treason to the Confederate government. Thereupon the doctor, who was superior in intelligence and information to the other men, and knew what was passing in the world, had advised him to free me, and to haul down the stars and bars, as the cause was lost beyond the hope of revival. "'My father flew into a terrible rage,' said Grace." He ordered that Dr. Ambrose be locked up at once, and it is his intention to have him shot when he shoots you. Miss Hetherell, I said, you must tell your father that Dr. Ambrose has nothing to do with my escape. That would do no good now, she said, and might do harm. It would not help Dr. Ambrose, for my father regards his proposition to surrender as the worst treason of all and if I were to say that it was I and not the doctor who helped you, he would not believe me. This put a new phase on the matter. I felt very sorry for the doctor who had got himself into trouble on my account. I did not know what to say, but Miss Hetherell interpreted my look. Do not fear for Dr. Ambrose, she said. Some of the men have begun to be of his way of thinking, and my father will not be able to carry out his sentence against either the doctor or you. I understood at once. A revolt was threatened in the camp, and her fear was neither for the doctor nor for me, but for her father. I felt rather cheap. I will help you all I can, Miss Hetherell, I said, a little stiffly, but I fail to see anything that I can do. As you know, I am a prisoner here. But you are not as strictly guarded as you were, she said. My father's rage against Dr. Ambrose has withdrawn his attention from you, and within a day you may have another chance to escape. He wants you to come now and testify against Dr. Ambrose. I cannot do that, I said. I do not want you to do so, she said quickly. You must say that you made your escape without help, that you picked the lock of your door, or anything else you choose to say. It was a falsehood she asked me to tell, but I was willing to tell it, since the interests of four persons were involved in it, hers, the doctor's, mine, and not least of all the colonel's. Truly my coming had aroused a mighty commotion in the house of Colonel Hetherell, C.S.A., and perhaps, too, had opened to it new ideas. It had never occurred to me before that I was such an important personage. I followed Miss Hetherell to the second sitting of the military court in the trial room, though this time as a witness and not as the accused. 
The colonel was majestic at the head of the table. He was in a splendid gray uniform, gay with gold lace, as if he deemed the occasion worthy of his best appearance. Crothers had taken the place of Dr. Ambrose as secretary, and the doctor himself was at the foot of the table. The examination was brief, and to the colonel very unsatisfactory. I made a poor witness. I denied that any one had helped me, and the doctor, with equal emphasis, denied complicity. The colonel frowned at me, but the doctor received the larger share of his attention, and I was of the opinion that the colonel considered him a greater villain than myself, as I was an enemy by birth, while the doctor was a household traitor. "'You do not deny making to me the proposition that we surrender to the federal government?' finally said the colonel. "'Not at all,' said the doctor, firmly. "'That was my suggestion, and I repeat it. "'We alone are holding out. "'What chance have we ever to carry our cause through to success?' "'Colonel Hetherill looked around at his men "'as if he feared the effect of those words upon them. "'They were impassive, though I inferred from what Grace had said "'that several were beginning to share the doctor's way of thinking.' "'Your answer,' said the colonel to Dr. Ambrose, "'is sufficient proof of treasonable designs. "'The answer itself I consider treason. "'I will hear no more.' "'He promptly dissolved the court, "'ordered Dr. Ambrose and myself to be locked up again, "'and refused to listen to anything his daughter wished to say. "'What further steps he took I do not know then,' for under escort I passed on to my room and was out of sight and hearing. That evening Grace came to my room again, and as before, she was visibly under the influence of strong emotion. "'You must escape again tonight,' she said, "'and this time you must not be overtaken. I have arranged everything, and it will be easy enough for you to reach the mountains.' "'What will become of Dr. Ambrose?' I asked. "'We will save him, too, though I do not yet know how,' she said. "'The doctor had taken his risk partly on my account, "'and I did not feel like abandoning him in danger. "'I am willing to admit also that I wanted to see "'how events at Fort Defiance would culminate. "'So I refused to leave the fort. "'My refusal greatly disturbed Grace.' and she begged me to go. Her cheeks were flushed, her eyes luminous, and she looked very beautiful. "'Would you have me think of myself alone?' I asked. "'Is it true that I seem to have brought trouble here, but I can't cure it by slipping away tonight? I mean to stay.' She had nothing more to say, but one look she gave me seemed to approve of my decision. She left the room hastily, and I did not hear the key turn in the lock. I tried the door and found that it was not locked. Through neglect or intention, I was free to go about for defiance, and I inferred that the colonel's affairs in truth were in a critical state if so little attention was paid to me. I looked out in the hall, but saw no one. I walked lightly to the top of the staircase, but hearing voices below, concluded it would be best to return to my room. From the window I saw that the drawbridge was up, and I doubted the chances of escape, even had I wished it. I remained there an hour or so, trying to decide upon the wisest course. Unable to come to any decision, I went into the hall again for lack of something better to do. From the top of the staircase, I heard voices in loud and excited conversation. I crept halfway down the steps. I stopped there to listen further, and feeling sure that some event of great importance had happened, I walked boldly all the way down. The front door, which looked out upon the little brass cannon, was wide open. Grace and Crothers stood near it, talking in hurried and excited tones. A half-dozen soldiers were about them, and occasionally they said something as if by way of suggestion. 
They paid no attention to me until I came so close that Grace herself could not help noticing me. "'Oh, Mr. West,' she cried, "'we are so glad you are here now.' Naturally, I was full of interest and curiosity and asked the cause of the trouble. Then they told me that Dr. Ambrose had escaped, by the connivance of someone, I guessed, and had fled to the mountains. The colonel, discovering his escape, had called upon his men to pursue him, and if necessary, shoot him on sight. They had refused unanimously to go, and the colonel, in his rage, had taken his old army rifle and had gone alone. Here, in truth, was a pretty muddle. The colonel's state of mind was such that without doubt he would shoot the doctor if he found an opportunity, which would be a double tragedy to all the people of Fort Defiance. "'The colonel must be pursued and overtaken,' I said. "'At once,' said Grace, with an emphasis that showed I had only seconded her own argument. Crothers and all the others looked at me as if waiting for a suggestion. It seemed by an easy transition to change from the prisoner of Fort Defiance to its chief. Since they looked upon me as such, that I decided to be. "'What road did the colonel take?' I asked of Crothers. "'There's only one passable way out of the mountains,' replied Crothers. "'The one you followed. We know that both the doctor and the colonel took it.' I saw a look of intelligence pass between him and Grace, and I wondered no longer at the doctor's escape or his destination. Our duty and the method of doing it were plainly before us. It required but a few minutes for me to organize our search-and-rescue expedition. I made Crothers my lieutenant and took all but four men, leaving these to care for the house. Food enough for several days, and blankets for the night were collected hastily, and then we were ready. Miss Hetherell approached, cloaked and hooded. To my protest, she replied with much firmness that she was going with us. "'But the road over these mountains is not fit for a lady to travel,' I said. "'I have been over that road often, and I know these mountains much better than you, Mr. West,' she replied. I could not dispute her assertion, and, moreover, her presence would be useful to us in certain contingencies. She was a strong, active girl, and I made no further objection. We left the house. The drawbridge was lowered to let us pass, and when we had crossed, was raised again. In a few minutes we were out of the valley and in the mountains, following the old road. As it was my second journey, I saw how easy it was for the colonel and his men to pursue and overtake me. It was the only real road through the mountains, and one followed it as naturally as the waters of a brook flow down its channel. "'How long a start of us has the colonel?' I asked. "'Not more than an hour,' replied Crothers. "'But he is strong in spite of his age, and a good mountaineer. I guess he can go faster than we can. It is true that one man, other things being equal, can travel faster than a half-dozen who stick together, and in it lay the danger that the colonel would outfoot us. But there was consolation in the thought that Dr. Ambrose had the same advantage. It was an indifferent night, neither very clear nor very dark. There was light enough to show the peaks and the ravines, but only to distort them. I let Crothers, who knew the way, take the lead, and I dropped back to the side of Miss Hetherill. We were silent for some time. Then I made a lame apology for blundering upon Fort Defiance and bringing such trouble to its inmates. "'It is not your fault that you came, Mr. West,' she said, "'and even if you had come by intention, we would have no right to complain.' Something of the kind was bound to happen some day. I was glad that she admitted the abnormal conditions of Fort Defiance. That she knew them was obvious, for she had passed but little of her life there, and knew the swing of the world. 
we made speed despite the roughness of the way some mists or fine clouds sifted before the moon and the visible world became small but we went on without uncertainty the fugitive could not well turn from the path nor could the pursuer i saw crothers looking up at the white silky clouds once he shook his head doubtfully but i did not ask him his thought with plenty of company the mountains did not impress or awe me as on the night of my flight once our course dipped into a little valley down which a brook trickled in the soft earth on either side of it the vigilant crothers saw footsteps which he said were those of two men we knew the two men must be the doctor and the colonel i should judge from those footprints though i can't tell precisely said crothers that we haven't gained anything on em this was somewhat discouraging and our enthusiasm did not grow when the path after leaving the valley or rather slit in the hills led up a very steep and long slope our muscles relaxed under the strain, and the breath came in irregular puffs. I was very tired, but I was not willing to own it, especially as I saw Grace walking with still vigorous step. She had told the truth when she said she was a better mountaineer than I. The mists thickened. The moon was but a faint glimmer through them, and they drifted like lazy clouds. Our world narrowed again, and instinctively we walked very close together. It was like a fog at sea. The damp of it carried a raw, penetrating chill. There was no wind to moan or sing through the ravines. The mountains were silent, save for ourselves. Crothers suggested a light, and produced from under his coat the torch with which he had provided himself in view of such emergency. It was a long stick, soaked in some compound of tar and turpentine, and when he lighted one end and held it aloft, it burned with energy, casting a bright, cheerful light. Nevertheless, we shivered in our clothes. The chill in the air was insistent, and the mist was soaking into the ground and the autumn foliage. All the world seemed to be a sweat, and poor woodsman as I was, I knew that this had its perils. Pneumonia is not picturesque, but it is very dangerous. Crothers looked at me several times as if he expected me to make a suggestion, but though by common consent I was the leader of the party, I waited for him to make it, as he knew more about the mountains and forests than I. But we plodded on for a long time before he spoke. Then he announced that we must stop for a while and build a fire. "'If we don't,' he said, "'we'll be soaked through and through with the cold mist, "'and in another hour some of us will be shaking with the chills and fever.' Grace protested against stopping. She was in the greatest alarm lest a tragedy should happen ahead of us, but while we felt the same fear, we recognized also the truth of the old maxim about the futility of too much haste. I pointed out the dangers to her, and urged that her father probably had sought shelter somewhere before this. She was compelled to yield, not to my arguments necessarily, but to her own judgment. I often think what a jolly world this would be if our judgment and our wishes were always agreed. We chose a somewhat sheltered spot, which was not difficult to find in a region of hill on hill, crisscrossed with ravines and gullies, and gathered heaps of brushwood. The fire was much more difficult to light than on the night when I was the colonel's prisoner, but we set it to burning at last, and glad we were when the flames rose high up in the chilly darkness. We refreshed ourselves with a little supper. Then Crothers insisted that some of us, and especially Miss Hetherell, should get a little sleep. Again she showed herself a wise girl by trying to obey, despite her wishes. We made her a bed of blankets between the fire and a cliff, and though she said she would not be able to sleep, in half an hour she slept. 
As she lay there with a bit of her pale, weary face showing above the blankets, I felt very sorry for her, far sorrier than I had ever felt for myself, even when under sentence of death. I could see the reality of her trouble, and I had never believed fully in mine. All the men except Crothers and I and a third rolled themselves into their blankets and slept. I sat by the fire, wondering what the outcome of it all would be. I noticed that Crothers continued to look up uneasily at the skies and the clouded moon, and at last I asked him what he might have on his mind. "'Bad weather,' he replied briefly. "'We have that already,' I said, pointing to the cliffs soaking in the wet mist. "'More coming,' he said, putting on a very weather-wise look. "'What do you expect?' I asked. "'Maybe snow, but more likely sleet, and that too before morning,' he replied. "'It's early for such things, but all the signs point that way.' I asked him no more. This was most unpromising, and gave full warrant for his grave looks. The mists were lifting, though very slowly, and were gathering in clouds above us. The peaks were ghostly gray, and the moon narrowed to a half-rim of steel, and then disappeared altogether. The dampness remained in the air, but the cold was too great for rain. As Crothers said, either snow or sleet would come. I suggested to Crothers that we make some sort of protection for Miss Hetherell. We built up little walls of brush on three sides of her and covered them with the same material. She slept so heavily from exhaustion, poor girl, that she never awakened to our noise, and when we finished our improvised hut our satisfaction was all the greater because we had not disturbed her at all. Then we built up the fires and waited for what might come. I dozed a while and awoke to find that the clouds had thickened. All the peaks were hidden by them, and there was some wind, just enough to make a subdued moan. Crothers said it lacked about two hours of day. I noticed that he had put the men at work again, and they had gathered brushwood sufficient to make the campfire of a regiment. "'The clouds will do what they're going to do very soon,' said Crothers, and he was right. Presently we heard a patter upon the dry leaves like the falling of dust shot. Little white kernels rebounded and fell again. One lodged in my eye, and I winked until I got it out. The patter increased. The dust shot turned to bird shot. "'Hail,' said Crothers. "'We're in for it. We woke all the men and made shelter for ourselves as best we could in the lee of the cliff. Another blanket spread over the top of Grace's rude bower was sufficient protection for her. Soon we had a fine downpour of hail. It was like a white bombardment, from which we were safe within our works. I would have been content to watch it had it not put such obstacles in the way of our pursuit. The ground whitened quickly under the fall of the hail, and by and by, when the wind shifted to the south, the clouds discharged rain instead of hail. This was no improvement, and in fact its probable sequel was what we dreaded most. The shift of the wind came again, and then happened what often happens in our fickle climate. The rain which covered everything turned to ice under the wind from the north, and in an hour the earth was clad in a complete suit of white armor. The sun was just rising above the last peaks. Every cloud had gone from the sky, and the day, hidden before by the wall of mountains, seemed to come all at once. Every ray of the sun was caught up by the sheet of white and gleaming ice and reflected back. Our eyes were dazzled by the brilliancy of the morning, for the ice covered everything. Every leaf, every twig was encrusted with it. It was all very beautiful and all very dangerous. Mountain climbing on sheets of ice is a slippery business. 
As usual, I turned to Crothers for advice. "'We'll have to creep along as best we can,' he said. "'But while we can't go fast, neither can the doctor nor the colonel.' This was the one redeeming point of the situation. Whatever affected us affected both the pursued, and we remained on an equal footing. We awoke Grace, who was astonished and dismayed at the sight of the earth cased in ice. Then we had a little breakfast, and prepared to resume our dangerous pursuit. I had heard of alpine climbing, and though I had never done any of it, the virtues of an alpenstock were not unknown to me. We selected slender but stout sticks from the brushwood, sharpened the ends, and having hardened them in the fire, made our start, each thus provided. It was treacherous work, and our falls were many, but we were satisfied to escape with mere bruises, for one might easily pitch over a precipice or tumble down a long, steep hill slope and become a mere bag of broken bones. The sun shone in splendor, but the rays were without warmth. They were white, not yellow, and a white light is always cold. The brilliant reflection from the ice fields forced us to keep our eyes half closed if we did not want to be blinded. Chapter 6 At the Hut The way was still certain, a rude path coiling among the hills, from which the sheets of ice glistening like new glass and as treacherous forbade us to turn. Sometimes the wind would blow, and the ice-clad bushes would rattle together to the tune of castanets. Our stock of bruises grew with steadiness and certainty, but we could boast of progress. Once the path dipped down between two peaks of unusual height. The wind was blowing rather sharply at the time, and from the white head of the higher peak on our left came a faint rumble. Crothers showed alarm and urged us to greater speed. I half guessed what he meant, and lent Grace an arm to hurry forward. The rumble grew to a roar, and we had just turned the dangerous defile when the avalanche plunged down the slope into the path we had left, setting all the echoes astir and sending up a cloud of white snow dust. I am of opinion that several tons of valuable ice and packed hail were wasted in that drift, but as we escaped it all, perhaps we have no right to complain. We passed the spot at which I had been retaken, and thence the way was new to me. But its character did not change. The untenanted mountains seemed to roll away to the end of the world. "'We ought to reach the hut by the middle of the afternoon,' said Crothers. "'What's the hut?' I asked, having heard nothing before of such a place. Then Crothers explained that it was a rude little cabin which the colonel had erected beside the path to be used as a stopping place on the way to the outside world, or as a lodge on hunting expeditions. He was hopeful that we would find the colonel or the doctor or both there. It seemed to me very probable that we would. Grace, who had been somewhat downhearted, though she never complained, cheered up at the prospect of the hut, and in truth all our little army pressed forward with fresh zest and enthusiasm. Hope is easily able to pin itself upon little things. We walked and slid along at much better speed, and Crothers even told stories of winter campaigns, though he was forced to admit that he had never found skates quite so necessary as they seemed to be now. Our path led directly toward a ridge which seemed to block the way like a wall. "'Up there on the comb of that ridge is the hut,' said Crothers. Though my muscles complained and my bruises were as numerous as the spots on a leopard, I was full of ambition to reach this little lodge of logs, which seemed to me to be a fit home for some Robinson Crusoe of the mountains. Presently Crothers uttered a joyful grunt. He never rose to the dignity of an exclamation, 
and pointed to a fine blue trail of smoke rising like a white plume from the slender comb of the ridge. "'That's from the hut,' he said, "'and somebody's there, sure.' His logic seemed sound. The smoke had a most comfortable, home-like look. It was a bit of warmth and cheer in the cold, white wilderness. It encouraged us so much that we were willing to wager we would find both the colonel and the doctor there, good friends again, and ready to return with us to Fort Defiance. As we advanced, the column was defined more clearly against the sky, and Crothers was positive that it came from the hut. "'It's built in a little patch of woods on a level spot of about a quarter of an acre,' he said and my eye says the smoke rises straight from that spot. By and by, as we climbed the slope, we could see the hut itself, coated with ice like the trees. The smoke was coming from the little mud chimney, and we guessed that a fine fire was blazing on the hearth. I, for one, began to wish that I was sitting in front of that same fire, listening to the popping of the dry wood as the flames ate into it. But Grace outstripped us, in so far as her cause for anxiety was greater than ours. She ran forward, pushed open the door of the hut, and sprang inside. We heard a cry of disappointment, and following her found the hut was empty, save for ourselves. Upon the stone hearth the fine fire that I had pictured to myself was really blazing. Upon a bench lay some scraps of bread and meat, but the host, whoever he might be, was absent. It was a little place, not more than seven or eight feet square, with a roof that the head of a tall man could touch. Two or three deerskins were on the floor, some antlers were fastened on the wall, and besides the bench there were three rude little stools. It was not exactly a drawing-room, but it was a warm and hospitable spot in the wilderness. At least it seemed so to me. Grace sat down on one of the stools and leaned her head against the wall, too brave to cry, but not strong enough to conceal all her disappointment. She had been sure that we would find the colonel in the hut. Since the landlord of the hotel is away, and there is no one to welcome us, I propose that we welcome ourselves, I said, wishing to appear cheerful. Crothers silently seconded the motion by throwing fresh wood on the fire, drawing up a stool, and warming his hands. Then we held a brief council of war. It was obvious that someone had been at the hut, but whether the colonel or the doctor, there was nothing to indicate. Whichever it might be, it was most likely that he would soon return, and we concluded that it was our best plan to pass the night there. It was late in the day, and no one could think of any other course that promised better. Crothers and I scouted a bit in the neighborhood, but we discovered nothing of the lodge's missing tenant. Whoever he was, he seemed to have gone on a long journey from his table and fireside, and we had little to do but appropriate his table, sit at his fireside, and wait for his return. The end of the day was near, and the night promised to be very cold. Autumn might be lingering yet in the lowlands, but up here in the mountains, close to the skies, winter was sovereign. The sun went over the hills, the whiteness of the earth turned to pallor, and in the dusk the icy mountains gleamed cheerless and cold. I was very glad that necessity bade us stay at the hut. We bestirred ourselves and gathered wood, for we intended to keep a good fire all night. We assigned grace to one corner beside the fireplace, and made a screen for it by hanging up two or three deerskins. Then we heaped the wood on the fire until the blaze roared up the chimney. A little window, a mere cut in the logs a half-foot square, was left open. 
When I went out, I could see the light of the fire shining through it and casting long streaks of red across the ice, the one friendly beacon in the dreary wilderness. As the day waned and the night took its place, I began to fear that it was neither the colonel nor the doctor who had built the fire, or surely he would have returned before this. After all, it might have been some stray hunter or mountaineer who had lighted the comfortable blaze, warmed himself, and passed on, leaving it to serve the same purpose for any other who might come. At that point the mountains were more accessible than farther back toward Fort Defiance. One might penetrate them in several directions if he were willing to risk falls on the sheet ice. Several of us, taking our alpenstocks, explored the neighborhood again. The light was sufficient, the reflection from the ice throwing a kind of pale glow over everything, but our explorations brought no profit and the night, as we had expected, turning very cold, we returned to the hut. We stacked our rifles against the wall and composed ourselves for rest. We did not realize, until the necessity for exertion was over, how very tired we were. Grace retired to her curtained corner, and in a few minutes was so still there that we knew she must be asleep, despite anxiety. Some of the soldiers stretched themselves upon the floor, and they, too, soon slept. Another, sitting upon a stool with his head against the wall, snored placidly. We saw no necessity for keeping watch, and even the vigilant Crothers laid down upon the bench, where his eyes soon closed and his breathing became long and regular. The last army of the Confederacy was sound asleep, and the colonel's Yankee spy alone was awake. They were old, men mostly, heads gray, almost white, and faces deeply seamed like the colonel's. But they looked to me like a loyal lot, and my sympathy went out to these old fellows, every one of whom I had no doubt carried old scars on his body. I was sitting on a stone before the fire, trying to read my fortune in the deep bed of coals. Tiring of the vain pursuit, I walked to the little window. The old soldier slept such a tired and heavy sleep that my footsteps did not disturb them. I could see nothing but the mountains, cold and white as a tombstone, and hear nothing but the occasional rattle of the loose ice as it fell from the trees and shattered on the thicker ice below. I went back to the fire, picked out a convenient place in front of it, and decided that I, too, would recognize the claims of exhaustion and sleep, which were now growing clamorous. Doubling up my blanket and putting it under my head for a pillow, I stretched myself out with my feet to the fire and resumed my old occupation of studying the red coals and the fortune that might be written for me there. I had done it many times as a boy, and as a man I was not changed. The regular and heavy breathing of the sleepers had something soothing in it. The logs burned through, crumbled, and fell in coals, adding to the glowing mass. With my half-closed eyes making much from little, and seeing things that were not, I built castles in the fire, and sent troops of real soldiers marching through them. When the fourth castle was but half finished, I closed my eyes and joined the others in sleep. Perhaps it was the strangeness of these scenes, much more strange to me than to the others, that disturbed and excited my brain while I slept, and by and by made me waken. The great heap of coals had sunk but little lower, and I reckoned that I had not slept more than two hours at the farthest. It was very warm in the room, for we had not been cherry with the fire, and I turned to the little window for fresh air. Framed in the window, I saw very distinctly a pair of bright eyes, 
and a part of a human face. The eyes gazed at me, and I am quite sure I returned the stare with equal intentness. We had hoped for a visitor, but we did not expect to find him at the window. I rose quickly to my feet, and the face was withdrawn. Wishing to look into the matter myself without disturbing the others, I walked lightly to the door, on the way stepping over the prostrate bodies of two or three members of the Confederate Army. I opened the door and went out. When I came to the window, I found that my man was gone, but not fifty feet away, walking toward the recesses of the mountains, was a tall, slender figure. I knew that military bearing could belong to none other in those mountains than Colonel Hetherill, and I felt sure also that it was he who had been looking through the window at us. I ran after him, but he was better accustomed to sleety mountains than I, and the distance between us widened. He curved around a hillock, and for a few moments was out of my sight. But when I, too, passed the hillock, I saw him straight ahead, his shoulders stooped a little, but walking swiftly as if he were bent upon reaching the very heart of the highest and most difficult mountains. I shouted to him to stop, and I knew he must have heard me, but for some time he paid no attention. At last he turned around and faced me. "'Why do you go away, Colonel?' I asked. "'I am no enemy of yours.' I am your friend. We have come to rescue you from the wilderness. Your daughter is back there in the hut. You are an infernal Yankee spy, he said, and you are worse than that. You have turned my people against me. Colonel, I said, protesting, don't delude yourself that way any longer. The war is over. It is not, he said. All my men may surrender, but I at least will hold out. Don't I know that they have given up? I saw them in the hut with you, and you were not a prisoner. Keep off, I tell you. Do not come near me. I was advancing toward him, not with any intent to harm him, instead the precise reverse and he, seeing that I would not stop, whipped a pistol out of his belt and fired at me. I suppose his hand was chilled by the cold, for the bullet flew wide of me, chipping splinters from the icy side of a hill. But I stopped, out of regard for my life, expecting another pistol, and he turned and continued his course into the higher mountains. I shouted to him to stop, and I shouted to my comrades in the hut, but the one would not, and the others would not hear. He never looked back, and at last disappeared in a thicket, every bush of which in the moonlight looked as if it were cast in silver. I walked back toward the hut, feeling some chagrin over my failure to keep one of the men for whom we had been looking after I had found him. I can say with truth that I was not angered at the colonel's bullet, as I thought I understood him. The light of the fire was still shining through the little window, or rather hole in the wall, and threw a long red bar of light across the whitened earth. It was a friendly beacon to any man in a normal state of mind. All the people in the hut were still sound asleep, the snore of some of the veterans placidly riding the night wind. I took Crothers gently by the shoulders, and succeeded in waking him without waking any of the others. Then I led him out of the hut and told him my story. He agreed with me that it was best not to say anything to Grace of the incident. But he was in a quandary about the wisest course for us to pursue in the morning, as the possible paths now led in several directions. This quandary was ended for the time by the sound of a rifle shot. We were so far from expecting anything of the kind that it startled us both very much. My fear, and I believe that of Crothers was the same, was lest the colonel and the doctor had met. 
We knew that the colonel had taken a rifle with him when he left Fort Defiance, and probably he had put it in some convenient place nearby when he came down to spy us out in the hut. "'Take this pistol,' said Crothers, shoving one into my hand. "'But remember, Colonel Hetherell must not be harmed.' The people in the hut seemed to be sleeping on calmly, and leaving them to their rest, we ran as fast as we could in the direction from which the shot had come. Though we had heard the report distinctly, owing to the rarefied mountain air, I judged that the gun had been fired at least a mile away. There were many echoes, and it was somewhat difficult for us to distinguish the true sound from the false but we agreed upon a general northeast course. When we had gone half a mile, the gun was fired again, the report echoing as gallantly in the still night as if it had been a little cannon instead of an ordinary rifle. "'Up the valley there,' cried Crothers. "'Follow that, and it will be sure to take us right.' I disagreed with him, however. The report seemed to me to have been farther to the left, and I insisted upon my opinion. "'All right,' said Crothers. "'You go that way, and I'll go up the gully. One or the other of us will be likely to strike it right.' He ran up the gully, and, obedient to his suggestion, I bent away to the left. But I found myself in a very slippery country, the mountains breaking there into successive little ridges like the waves of the sea, though the general direction was upward. Luckily there was a good growth of bushes, and more than once I kept myself from falling by grasping at the outstretched boughs. When I had nearly reached the spot from which I thought the shot had come, I saw a man standing near a tree. The next instant he saw me and sprang behind the tree. I caught but a glimpse of the slender figure and gray hair, but it was enough for me. I had found the colonel again, and I did not mean for him to try a second shot at me which might be better aimed than the first. I sprang behind some rocks, where I was adequately sheltered so long as he remained in his present position. I feared that he would try to get a shot at me, thinking I was trying to do him harm, and I shifted my position a little, moving farther on behind the wall of rock. I had no intention of firing at him for several reasons, and I recognized that it was a very difficult task for me to take an armed man against whom I had no intention of using arms. But I believed that if I could slip upon him unawares, I could overpower him with superior force and strength and disarm him. Ledges of rock were plentiful there, the mountain being broken into an infinite succession of ridges and ravines. Once I slipped on the sleet and crashed into a thicket which stopped me. But the ice knocked off the boughs fell with a rattle like hail, and I was in a tremor lest the colonel should fire at me from some point of vantage before I could regain my feet. But the shot did not come, and righting myself, I went on, wishing that my shoes were shod with sharp nails and plenty of them. The ground seemed favorable for my design. The gully up which I was creeping curved around behind the tree that sheltered Colonel Hetherell and I believed that with caution I could suddenly throw myself upon him from the rear and overwhelm him. I dropped down on my hands and knees, and though my progress was slow, I avoided another fall. The colonel gave no sign. I presumed that he was behind the tree, watching for an attack and seeking an opening in his turn. I rose up a little, trying to peep over the wall of the gully toward the tree, and caught a glimpse of a gray head lifted above the same gully wall, but just around the curve. He dropped back like a flash, and from prudential motives I did the same. The curve of the gully at that point was sharp. In fact, it was more of an angle than a curve, and he was only a yard or two from me. 
As I hugged the wall, I could hear his heavy, tired breathing. I thought once of turning about and going back, but I concluded that it would never do. The colonel had escaped me once, and I would be ashamed to confess to my comrades that he had escaped me twice. I resumed my continuous creep, stealing forward inch by inch until I came to that point in the curve beyond which I could not pass without coming into his sight. Then I gathered myself for a great effort, sprang to my feet, and darted around the curve, ready to spring upon him and surprise him. I encountered another large and living body rushing in my direction, and the encounter was so violent that I fell back on the ice and sleet, half stunned. In a few moments I recovered and sat up. Dr. Ambrose was sitting on a stone and looking at me, his eyes full of reproach. He pointed to a purple contusion on his forehead. "'You did that,' he said. I felt a growing lump over my left ear. "'You did that,' I said. He surveyed me, still with reproach. "'I took you for Colonel Hetherill,' he said. I put some reproach into my own gaze. "'I took you for Colonel Hetherill, too.' I said. I expected to take Colonel Hetherell to the hut, he said mournfully. I expected to do the same, I said sadly. Since I can't take the Colonel to the hut, he said, I will take you. Very well, then, I said. While you are taking me there, I will take you, too. Shake hands, doctor. I'm tremendously glad to see you, you old rebel. We shook hands with the greatest good will. Then he went to the tree and recovered the rifle which was leaning behind it, taken by him in his flight. We started back to the hut, and on the way he gave an account of himself. He had fled from Fort Defiance without any clear object in view except to escape the colonel's wrath which he believed would be but temporary. When the sleet storm came on, he had endured it for a while. At last he reached the hut, built a big fire, warmed himself thoroughly, and then went out to look for the colonel, thinking that the fierceness of the weather would have chilled his rage by this time. Seeing nothing of him, he had fired his rifle twice in the hope of attracting his attention, and was returning to the hut when he caught a glimpse of me, and believed by my actions that I was Colonel Hetherell, and moreover that I was Colonel Hetherell still inflamed against him. Then he had hidden behind the tree, hoping just what I had hoped, and trying to do it. If it had been the Colonel, and he had got the first chance and fired at you, what would you have done, doctor? I asked. Colonel Hetherell saved my life twice, once at Stone River and once at Chickamauga, he replied. And I could get no more direct answer out of him. The doctor looked as if he had been having a hard time. There was no counterfeit about his joy at seeing me. His face was haggard, and scales of ice were on his clothing. I told him about my meeting with the colonel earlier in the evening, and it seemed to take some of the hope out of him. "'The colonel has one idea fixed in his head,' he said, "'and I do not think anything can drive it out.' I raised my voice and shouted for Crothers, and in a few moments his answering cry came. His meeting with the doctor was as that of two veterans should be, joyful, but repressed. We went back to the hut where we found the army still asleep, but we awoke two of the men, directing them to watch until daylight, while we three lay down upon the floor and went to sleep. Grace's pleasure when she saw the doctor in the morning sound and well was great, though she said but little. I knew the relief it was to her. 
but we began at once to organize the search for the last rebel. The hut was to remain a base of operations for the present, and despite her protests, we insisted that Grace remain there at least that day. I had some hope that the colonel, pressed by cold and hunger, might return to the hut, but the doctor shattered this hope by saying that he might find shelter and food elsewhere in the mountains. "'He was fond of hunting,' said the doctor, "'and it is more than likely that in such a wilderness "'he provided one or more little camps besides this for future use. "'We divided into two parties. "'Crothers led one and the doctor the other. "'I went with the doctor. "'I waved my handkerchief as a sign of good cheer to Grace, "'who stood in the doorway.' and we were soon in the mazes of the higher mountains. A good sun came out, and in an hour the weather had turned warm enough to permit snow, but not warm enough to melt the ice and sleet. The clouds soon gathered, obscuring the sun, and for an hour we had a gentle snow which covered the ground a quarter of an inch deep, but did not trouble us as the morning was without wind. It made our footing much less uncertain, and the doctor drew further encouragement from it, as we might find the colonel's footsteps if he should move about after the snowfall. The doctor hoped no more than what proved to be the truth, for as the noon hour approached, one of the men called attention to footsteps in the snow. We believed they could be no other than the colonel's, and we followed the trail, which led along the hillside over rocks and through scrub. It was difficult to follow, and we might well have credited it to a younger man had not the doctor assured us that the colonel was a most agile mountaineer. The trail left the hillside shortly and entered a fairly level bit of country, which by a stretch of courtesy one might have called a small plateau. Many scrub bushes grew upon it, but we could follow the footsteps, whether they led through the thickets or the open. The doctor confessed that the region was new to him, but from the direct manner in which the trail led on, he did not believe it was strange to Colonel Hetherill. The plateau, by and by, dipped down into a valley, which in its turn gave way to a lot of knife-edged hills, thick set with sharp and pointed stones. But after this we had the plateau again, and the trail was there still before us, though it seemed to lead straight toward a white peak too steep for ascent. The peak was fringed with woods at the base. As we approached these woods with our heads down, our eyes fixed upon the trail of footsteps in the snow, we were hailed in a loud voice and ordered to stop. We saw a little shack built against the trunk of one of the big trees. It was thatched over with bark. Under the pent, the muzzle of a rifle was poked out at us in the most alarming way. All of us had recognized the voice as that of Colonel Hetherill, and we believed the rifle barrel to be an asset of the same man. The doctor answered the hail with the loud announcement that we were friends. But the colonel bade us be off at once, or he would shoot. Knowing his temper, we shifted our ground with great promptness. But we did not leave. Instead, we took refuge in the woods and undertook to prepare a plan of campaign. The shack was an exceedingly small affair, but from the roof we saw a piece of old stovepipe projecting, and we guessed that he was provided against the cold. How he stood in the matter of food and water we could not know. But we decided to treat with him at once, thinking we could not appeal to his better reason. The doctor hoisted my white handkerchief on the end of a stick and approached the hut. But the colonel threatened us again with the rifle, and was all the more furious because the bearer of the flag was the doctor who had assisted in my escape, and therefore was the worst traitor in Fort Defiance. 
End of chapter 6